Tonight, a prominent Canadian professor awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. I'm still slightly in shock. Jeffrey Hinton, honored as a pioneer of modern day artificial intelligence. Sometime in the next 20 years, AI will become more intelligent than us. Worries about technology he helped create and where he sees it going. If you choose to stay in one of those evacuation areas, you're going to die. The urgent warnings as Hurricane Milton regains strength to a Category 5 and barrels towards Florida. Inside the Israeli-occupied West Bank and the spike in settler violence. I would just like to see the process be more transparent. An American doctor's bureaucratic ordeal to move to Canada to help ease a massive backlog at an Ontario clinic. Plus, the serious burns and accusations of a neighbor throwing boiling water over a boy's head in a Montreal suburb. And a spectacular sight in the skies. Laid on the grass, staring and watching it dance back and forth. The celestial show stretching from Alberta to Ontario. And I've never seen it like it just becomes the whole sky. It's, it's phenomenal. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. The Canadian man dubbed the godfather of artificial intelligence says he is flabbergasted after receiving one of the most prestigious awards in the world. Jeffrey Hinton is one of two recipients of this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, recognized for his pioneering work on machine learning that Hinton has described as both revolutionary and risky. Last year, he left his role at Google, a move he says that's allowed him to speak more openly about the dangers of a technology he warns could outsmart humans. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the global accolade and the reaction. In the world of artificial intelligence, Jeffrey Hinton spliced the connection between the mind and machine. I'm hoping AI will lead to tremendous benefits, to tremendous increases in productivity, and to a better life for everybody. Hinton transformed the field of AI with his work on neural network models, a computer program inspired by the natural neural structure found in the human brain. I had absolutely no idea that I'd even been nominated. A University of Toronto professor, Hinton and John Hopfield of Princeton University were each given the award for their discoveries, which have enabled machine learning. They were the persons who did the, the fundamental work based on physical understanding, which has led to the, to the uh, to the revolution we see today. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau shared these words, saying in part that Dr. Hinton is a stalwart in this field. Celebrated as one of the godfathers of AI, he brings decades of leading expertise in AI research. Across Canada, Hinton's Nobel nod is also being celebrated by the computer science community. Jeff took those ideas and those concepts and the inspiration from physics and biology and ran with them through what, what was this really weird little idea in computer science that not many people had time for and just with absolute conviction pursued it and made what we have now a reality. Though it's the potential future reality of AI that has Hinton, who left his role with Google's deep learning AI team, using his voice to express his concerns about the path the technology may lead humanity down. Quite a few good researchers believe that sometime in the next 20 years, AI will become more intelligent than us. And we need to think hard about what happens then. Hinton is much more enthusiastic about how AI may help the field of medicine, from assisting a doctor in making a patient diagnosis to developing cures for previously incurable diseases. Omar. Adrian, thank you. Another practical application of the scientists' work is improved climate modeling. And tonight, forecasters are relying on the best technology they have to track a monster hurricane that has regained strength to a Category 5. CTV's Joy Malbin on Milton's menacing march towards Florida. Along Florida's west coast, it already looks like a ghost town. Millions ordered to get out. Roads are clogged. It's bumper to bumper traffic. And with stark warnings like this. If you choose to stay in one of those evacuation areas, you're going to die. There's a sense of urgency. As Hurricane Milton barrels towards Tampa, Florida's third largest city. Even from space, it looks like a monster. Possibly the worst storm to hit Florida in a century. And it hasn't even made landfall yet. 
now, now. You should have already evacuated. It's a matter of life and death, and that's not hyperbole. It's a matter of life and death. As airports suspend service, Canadians Dave and Rhonda Thompson got one of the last flights out. The gas stations have actually ran out of uh, fuel when we arrived uh, at the station to, to fill up. And um, you can see everybody is preparing for a huge storm. Hurricane hunters flying into the eye of the storm. You can see how powerful it is. Driven by climate change and warm waters, Milton is expected to explode in size, bringing a wall of water nearly five meters high. And making it even more dangerous, all that debris left over from Hurricane Helene could become flying projectiles. The looming destruction left this weatherman shaken. It's just an incredible, incredible, incredible hurricane. I apologize. This is just horrific. Preparing for an historic storm, Florida's governor has mobilized 8,000 National Guard search and rescue crews on standby as Florida braces for the worst. Omar? Anxious hours ahead. Joy, thank you. Authorities in the U.S. say they have thwarted an Election Day terror plot. The FBI arrested 27-year-old Nasir Ahmed Tohidi after he bought rifles and ammunition from an undercover agent. The Afghan national, living in Oklahoma, is accused of orchestrating an attack on Americans on November 5th on behalf of ISIS. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that less than two weeks after the killing of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, Israel has also killed his successor. We took out thousands of terrorists, including Nasrallah himself and Nasrallah's replacement, and the replacement of his replacement. Israel's military has yet to confirm it. The announcement comes as Israel expands its ground campaign in southern Lebanon. New video shows Israeli troops raising their flag near a village along Lebanon's southern border. Hezbollah striking back, launching about 180 rockets on northern Israel, causing damage in the port city of Haifa. In the occupied West Bank, there's been a surge in violence between Israeli settlers and Palestinians. CTV's Heather Wright reports on the devastation on the ground. In the village of Jamaim, Mohammed Awad and his brothers harvest olives. Or at least they did until yesterday. He says they were out in the field with other farmers on the first day of the harvest when a group of Israeli settlers approached them and began hitting them with sticks and throwing stones. Awad has 15 stitches in his head and he was sprayed in the face with pepper spray. Eight people were injured during yesterday's attack, including this man, who is so afraid he doesn't want to be on camera. His leg was broken and he has welts on his body. So does his 11-year-old brother, who was also attacked. I asked the boy's father what he thought of adults attacking a child. Can you imagine, he says, I am speechless. This is what many olive farms in the occupied West Bank look like. This one is on the side of a road. And many Palestinians use olive farming as a way to supplement their income. But harvesting the olives is becoming even more challenging. As we were leaving this farm, our escort received a message about another one down the road. The settlers are here. They are burning our equipment. Don't come. The war in Gaza has caused tensions to flare across the region and especially here, where Israel has ramped up its military activities. There have been sweeping restrictions on movement repeated raids in cities and increased security around Israeli settlements. More than 500,000 people live in those settlements, some for ideological and religious reasons, others for the low cost of living. Only a small number are involved in attacks on Palestinians. The settlements are considered illegal under international law. Israel disputes this and the number of settlements are expanding. Some Palestinians flee their homes due to violence, others are evicted. Last month, the UN's human rights chief accused Israel of disregarding international law in the occupied territories. Deadly and destructive operations, some at a scale not witnessed in the last two decades, are worsening. Those who support settlements say they improve the security of Israel and act as a buffer zone. Critics say they undermine the viability of a two-state solution and threaten peace. Mohammed Awad says he wants to live in peace and be safe, but says there's no way. He does hope that one day 
it will be possible for his daughter. Both Canada and the United States have issued a number of sanctions against extremist Israeli settlers, but rights groups say there are few consequences in the West Bank, where arrests and prosecutions are rare. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. Vancouver police revealed late tonight they are investigating a pro-Palestinian protest yesterday on the anniversary of the Hamas attack on Israel. A Canadian flag was lit on fire and torn apart at the rally, organized by the group Samidun. Police say some protesters expressed, quote, solidarity with terrorist groups, and they are looking into whether criminal offenses were committed. In Ottawa today, both the Liberals and the Conservatives condemned that incident. The Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was not allowed to speak in the Commons, penalized by the House Speaker for not withdrawing comments yesterday directed at Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. Tracking the story is CTV's Michael Couture. And Mike, walk us through what led to this moment in the Commons today. Well, Omar, Pierre Polyev is not backing down after accusing Melanie Jolie of, quote, pandering to Hamas supporters because he says the minister refused to condemn anti-Semitic chants. Now, the Speaker of the House asked Polyev to withdraw his comments, but Polyev has refused. So the Speaker ruled that Polyev would not be recognized in the House of Commons today. Now, that's a significant punishment for someone whose job it is to hold the government to account. But Polyev went even further, blaming the Trudeau government for a spike in reported hate crimes across Canada and the rise of anti-Semitism on the streets of this country. A foreign affairs minister in Canada should find it very easy to condemn those kinds of remarks, but she didn't because she's pandering politically, which is what Justin Trudeau has been doing for the last nine years. But minister Jolie held her own press conference today in response to Polyev, where she said she does condemn the anti-Israel slogans and Hamas. She added, it's up to all politicians to fight against hate. We all have to do a better job everyone in the House of Commons. And so we'll continue to denounce any form of anti-Semitism that is happening on our streets, in our schools, against hospitals, synagogues, etc. Well, she also accused Polyev of cozying up to far-right groups, and Jolie reiterated that she doesn't believe the Conservative leader is fit to govern this country. Omar? All right, Mike, thanks. A 10-year-old boy was left with horrific burns after his neighbor allegedly poured a pot of boiling water over his head in a Montreal suburb. And a warning, the images are graphic. The alleged incident happened when the child walked by the woman's house on his way back home from school. His parents say he suffered second-degree burns to his face, neck, and upper body. Papa, papa, yeah. The boy's father says his son came to the door screaming that a woman burned him and the skin on his face was falling off. The woman in her 40s was arrested and released with a promise to appear in court. A shocking allegation from the lead singer of Canadian pop punk band Sum 41. Derek Wibley is accusing a former manager and member of the band Treble Charger of sexual abuse, which he denies. CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin reports. The faster we're falling through some 41's rise to chart-topping mega success, frontman Derek Wibley alleges he had a dark secret. He wanted to have a sexual relationship with me. In his memoir, in a series of interviews about the book, he alleges a longtime band manager pressured him into a non-consensual sexual relationship. In the book, Walking Disaster, My Life Through Heaven and Hell, he writes of recording triumphs and of trashed hotel rooms, celebrities that did Hollywood parties. He says through it all, he was ashamed to tell bandmates their manager may have groomed and pressured me from a young age to be in a sexual relationship with him. Hi, I'm Greg Norrie from Treble Charger. That manager is Greg Norrie, also the frontman of a band called Treble Charger. He was the manager of Sum 41 from the late 90s to 2004. Nori has denied all allegations. Wibley met him when he was 16 and describes him as a local hero to him. He says Nori first kissed him in a bathroom at a warehouse party when he was 18 and high on ecstasy. Wibley says he long thought it was his own fault, but one of the few people he told was his first wife, Avril Lavigne. When I told her what it was, she's like, that's abuse. And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, I said, I, I went along with it. And, you know, it was, that was the first time I'd ever heard the word associated with that situation. 
In interviews, Whibley said he figured he would take this to his grave, but that writing his memoir was part of closing a chapter of his life. Nori has not replied to a request for comment, but told the Globe and Mail that the allegations are false and that he's hired a lawyer. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Coming up. I would just like to see the process be more transparent um, and to be quicker. An American doctor's two-year wait to help ease Canada's physician crunch. More than 6.5 million Canadians still don't have access to a family doctor. Many are leaving the profession because of burnout and pay, and efforts to train and recruit new ones aren't happening quickly enough. As CTV's Avis Favreau tells us in this exclusive story tonight, one American doctor's plans to come north are tied up in red tape. Inside this medical clinic near Guelph, Ontario, are patient exam rooms sitting empty working as our storage space for now. With over a thousand people waiting for a family doctor here, the husband and wife physicians who run the clinic can't meet the demand. Six to ten times a day, can you accept someone as a patient? And I have over 1,600 patients and I just can't keep saying no. We need help. Manu and Pooja Kaushik hired an American doctor, Ashley Duncan. She wants to move to Ontario. It's closer to her parents in Michigan, and she and husband Matt like the safety and lifestyle in Canada. But she's been waiting two years and counting. I would just like to see the process be more transparent um, and to be quicker. Duncan described a long bureaucratic process, saying it took nine months for her medical credentials to be certified, discovered her application with Immigration Canada uses a point system and that she didn't have enough to be allowed to apply to immigrate. We didn't work in Canada, so we lost points for that. We don't have, um, you know, first-degree relatives in Canada, so we lost points for that. The Canadian clinic also had to provide a labour market impact assessment for permission to bring her in as a foreign worker, which was then rejected because the clinic itself wouldn't be paying her. They wouldn't approve the LMIA because I'm going to be paid by the government, um, which just does not make any sense. It doesn't make sense to the patients here either. Despite what we hear that they're trying to fast track people to come into Canada, he's having over two years of problems. He, he cannot get this person to come in and it's mind boggling. Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada told CTV News in a statement it continues to prioritize work permit applications from workers in 24 essential occupations in health care. But with 6.5 million Canadians without primary care, getting more family doctors into the system quickly is critical. I think the will is there. I, I, I just don't think the system is set up to be um, efficient uh, at, this, at this stage. If we don't get help, how long can we sustain this? This is not sustainable. The Medical Council of Canada, which is the entry point for physicians who want to come here, says it's working on a strategic plan to help them navigate this complex process. Dr. Duncan, meanwhile, says her application is still in progress as she waits. Omar? All right, Avis, thank you for this tonight. Still ahead, prime examples of a shopping scam and how to avoid clicking the bait. If you're planning to do some shopping during Amazon Prime Days this week, buyer beware. Experts are warning there's a scam circulating involving fake websites. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth on what to look out for. Prices are down, online bargains are on the rise. But this shopper chose to stay offline during Amazon's big deal days. Because I think the, the scammers are... Right on it. According to the cybersecurity company Checkpoint Software Technologies, more than a thousand new Amazon related websites popped up in the past 30 days. Almost 90% were deemed suspicious. Ritesh Kotak says fraudsters are finding creative ways to scam customers. We're going to see refund scams. 
where you're claimed a refund and you got to click on a link, but in actuality, they're trying to steal your information. There are also third party scams. You think you're buying a legitimate product, but in actuality, it's a bait and switch or you're buying counterfeit. Retail analyst Bruce Winder says Amazon is urging customers to not fall for fake urgency when they are pressured to pay right away. Trying to get you to buy now or do it now when there's really no reason to. These scams are not just online. Scammers have also been known to contact Amazon customers directly by phone. Amazon has an entire division dedicated to protecting its customers from being ripped off. They've also have a, a way that sort of a hotline, a tip line that you can write in to Amazon and let them know on email or on their website if you think something is scammed so they can verify it. Amazon also has online warnings and tips on its verified website to educate customers so they can avoid being scammed. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. After the break, nature's remarkable display in the sky. The Northern Lights made a magnificent appearance across a large part of North America. And if you missed the stunning show, here's CTV's Kathy Lee with a recap of the dazzling display. The dark canvas came alive with vibrant colors, dancing in a mesmerizing display. It was crazy. Um, I'd never actually seen the red, um, like the red lights in the sky. Uh, and I've never seen it like just encompassing the whole sky. It was, it was phenomenal. I consider my backyard where it's kind of hollowed out and, and look up. And so laid on the grass for about half an hour, staring and watching it dance back and forth. Many in Canada and the United States had their eyes on the sky Monday night, including avid Aurora Borealis chasers who know the best spots for a stunning shot. When you go away from light pollution, away from those bright city lights, and you go somewhere dark where you're not obscured by that light, you're going to see those colors more defined and more vivid. Almost better than seeing Aurora for the first time is being with someone else who is seeing Aurora for the first time. Um, I've had that opportunity a lot and it's, it's quite addictive. The source of the Vivid Light show was from the sun's solar flares, which becomes active every 11 years and are currently at their peak or solar maximum. Experts say the flares create coronal mass ejections or a blob that can hit the earth. The coronal mass ejection, this blob that comes from the sun, has a magnetic field balled up inside it. And it can be pointing up or down. And it has to connect with the Earth's magnetic field in the right way. If that right connection is made, the blob transfers its energy to the Earth, producing the intense cosmic wonder. I've been doing this for 17 years, and the things I saw last night, I, I've never seen before. So it was quite magical and remarkable. And because the solar maximum can last for a while, it potentially could mean more magical kaleidoscopes in the winter months. Kathy Lee, CTV News, Calgary. Such a gorgeous display. And that's a snapshot of this Tuesday. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.